One day in February, there appeared on Mr. Williams's desk in the Art Museum of a certain university a catalogue from J.W. Britnell, a London dealer. And accompanying it was a typewritten communication, which ran as follows. <clears throat> Dear sir, we beg to call your attention to number 978 in our accompanying catalogue, which we shall be glad to send on approval, yours faithfully, J.W. Britnell. To turn to number 978 in the accompanying catalogue was the work of a moment, and in the place indicated, Mr. Williams found the following entry. 978, unknown. Interesting mezzotint, view of a manor house, early part of the century, black frame, two guineas. It was not especially exciting, and the price seemed high. However, as Mr. Britnell, who knew his business and his customers, seemed to set store by it, Mr. Williams wrote a postcard for the article to be sent on approval. A parcel of any kind always arrives a day later than you expect it, and that of Mr. Britnell proved no exception to the rule. It was delivered at the museum by the afternoon post of Saturday, after Mr. Williams had left his work. And it was accordingly brought round to his rooms in college by the attendant. Here he found it when he came in to tea with a friend, Professor Binks. It was a rather indifferent mezzotint, and an indifferent mezzotint is perhaps the worst form of engraving known. It presented a full-face view of a not-so-very-large manor house of the last century, with three rows of plain sashed windows with rusticated masonry about them, a parapet with balls or vases at the angles, and a small portico in the centre. On either side were trees, and in front a considerable expanse of lawn. The legend AWF Sculpsit was engraved on the narrow margin, and there was no further inscription. The whole thing gave the impression that it was the work of an amateur, what in the world Mr. Britnell could mean by affixing the price of two guineas to such an object was more than Mr. Williams could imagine. He turned it over with a good deal of contempt. Upon the back was a paper label, the left hand half of which had been torn off. All that remained were the ends of two lines of writing. The first had the letters N-G-L-E-Y Hall, the second S-S-E-X. What is this place? said Binks. Just what I'm going to try and find out, said Williams going to the shelf for a gazetteer. Look at the back. Somethingly Hall, either in Sussex or Essex. But I can't imagine how Britton will think he can charge two guineas for it. There aren't even any figures to give it life. I don't think it's so badly done, replied Binks. The light is rather cleverly given, and I would have thought there were figures, or at least a figure just on the edge in front. And indeed there was. Hardly more than a black blot in one corner of the engraving, the head of a man or woman, a good deal muffled up, the back turned to the spectator and looking towards the house. Williams had not noticed it before. Still, he said, I can't spend two guineas of museum money on a picture of a place I don't know. Further attempts by Williams to locate the subject of his picture in the gazetteer proved unsuccessful, and in due course he went down to hall for dinner. Later in the evening, he returned with a few of his colleagues, and I have little doubt that whist was played and tobacco smoked. During a lull in these operations, Williams picked up the mezzotint from the table without looking at it and handed it to a person mildly interested in art, telling him where it had come from and the other particulars which we already know. The gentleman took it carelessly, looked at it, then said in a tone of some interest, it's really a very good piece of work, Williams. And the figure, though it's rather too grotesque, is somehow very impressive. Yes, isn't it? said Williams, who was just then busy giving whiskey and soda to others of the company and was unable to come across the room to look at the view again. But some time past midnight, after the visitors had departed and as he was lighting his bedroom candle, the picture once again caught his eye. And what he saw made him very nearly drop the candle on the floor. In the middle of the lawn, in front of the unknown house, there was a figure where no figure had been at five o'clock that afternoon. It was crawling on all fours towards the house, and it was muffled in a strange black garment with a white cross on the back. I do not know what is the ideal course to pursue in a situation of this kind. I can only tell you what Mr. Williams did. He took the picture, locked it up in a drawer, and retired to bed. But first, he wrote out and signed an account of the extraordinary change which the picture had undergone since it had come into his possession. The following morning, he invited his neighbour, Nisbet, to breakfast. 
During the meal, nothing was said about the mezzotint by William, save that he had a picture on which he wished for Nisbet's opinion. But afterwards, when the morning pipe was at last lighted, he unlocked the drawer and, without looking at the picture, put it into Nisbet's hands. Now, he said, I want you to tell me exactly what you see in that picture. Describe it, if you don't mind, rather minutely. I'll tell you why afterwards. Well, said Nisbet, I have here a view of a country house, English, I presume, by moonlight. Moonlight? Are you sure of that? Certainly. The moon appears to be on the wane, if you wish for details, and there are clouds in the sky. All right. Go on. Though I'll swear there was no moon when I saw it first. Well, there's not much more to be said, continued Nisbet. The house has three rows of windows, five in each row, except at the bottom where there's a porch instead of the middle one. But what about figures, said Williams? There aren't any. What? No figure on the grass in front? Not a thing. You'll swear to that? Certainly I will. Oh, there's just one other thing. One of the windows on the ground floor left of the door is open. Is it really? cried Williams in great excitement. My goodness. He must have got in. It was quite true. There was no figure, and there was the open window. Williams, after a moment of speechless surprise, went to the writing table and scribbled for a short time. Then he brought two papers to Nisbet and asked him first to sign one, his own description of the picture, which you've just heard, and then to read the other, which was Williams's statement written the night before. Yes, said Nisbet. I expect you're right. He's got in. It looks very much as if we were assisting at the working out of a tragedy somewhere. The question is, has it happened already, or is it going to come off? We must find out what the place is and get this thing photographed before it goes further. While Nisbet dealt with the photograph, Williams went in search of Mr. Green, who had been college bursar for many years. The college had property in Sussex and Essex, and Green had travelled widely in both counties. However, he was not to be found for the moment. His business had taken him to Brighton, and he was not expected to return until the following day. What do you mean to do now? asked Nisbet. Are you going to sit down and watch the picture all day? Well, no, I think not, said Williams. I rather imagine we're meant to see the whole thing. And besides, I have a kind of idea that it wouldn't change much, if at all, in the daytime. We might go out for a walk this afternoon and come in to tea or whenever it gets dark. I shall leave it out on the table here. My skip can get in, but no one else. It was five o'clock when they returned to Williams's rooms. The first thing they saw was the picture leaning up against a pile of books on the table, as it had been left. And the next thing was Williams's skip seated on a chair opposite, gazing at it with undisguised horror. He was a servant of considerable standing, and nothing could be more alien to his practice to be seen sitting on his master's chair or appearing to take any particular notice of his master's furniture or pictures. Begging your pardon, sir, he said, but it ain't the sort of picture I should hang where my little girl could see it. If she were to catch a sight of this skeleton here, or whatever it is, carrying off the poor baby, she would be in a taking. It don't seem a right picture to be laying about, sir, not where anyone that's liable to be startled should come on it. With these words, the excellent man went to continue the round of his masters, and you may be sure the gentleman whom he left lost no time in re-examining the engraving. There was the house, as before under the waning moon and the drifting clouds. The window that had been opened was shut and the figure was once more on the lawn. But not this time crawling cautiously on hands and knees. Now it was erect and stepping swiftly with long strides to the front of the picture. The moon was behind it and the black drapery hung down over its face so that only hints of it could be seen. And what was visible made the spectators profoundly thankful that they could see no more than a white dome-like forehead and a few straggling hairs. The head was bent down and the arms were tightly clasped over an object which could be dimly seen and identified as a child. Whether dead or living, it was impossible to say. The legs of the appearance alone could be plainly discerned, and they were horribly thin. 
From five to seven, the companions sat and watched the picture by turns, but it never changed. They agreed at last that it would be safe to leave it while they dined in the hall. When they returned, the figure was gone, and the house was quiet under the moonbeams. There was nothing for it but to spend the evening over gazetteers and guidebooks. Williams was the lucky one at last, and perhaps he deserved it. At 11.30 p.m., he read from Murray's Guide to Essex the following lines. Sixteen and a half miles, Anningley. The church has been an interesting building of the Norman date, but it was extensively classicized in the last century. It contains the tombs of the family of Francis, whose mansion, Anningley Hall, a solid Queen Anne house, stands immediately beyond the churchyard in a park of about 80 acres. The family is now extinct. The last heir having disappeared mysteriously in infancy in the year 1802. The father, Mr. Arthur Francis, was known locally as a talented amateur engraver in Mezzotit. After his son's disappearance, he lived in complete retirement at the hall and was found dead in his studio on the third anniversary of the disaster, having just completed an engraving of the house, impressions of which are of considerable rarity. The next day, Mr. Green, the bursar, returned from Brighton and was at once able to identify the house as Anningley Hall. Is there any kind of explanation of the figures, was the question which Williams naturally asked. I don't know, I'm sure. What used to be said in the place when I first knew it was that old Francis was always very much down on poachers, and by degree he got rid of them all but one. Gordy was his name, and he was the last surviving member of a very old family. I believe they were lords of the manor at one time. What, like the man in Tess of the D'Urbervilles, Williams put in. Yes, I dare say. It's not a book I could ever read myself, but this fellow could show a row of tombs in the church there that belonged to his ancestors, and all that went to sire him a bit. Anyway, he always kept just on the right side of the law, until one night the keepers found him at it in a wood right at the end of the estate. Well, you can imagine there was a row, and this man Gordy was unlucky enough, poor chap, to shoot a keeper. Well, that was just what Francis wanted, and poor Gordy was strung up in double-quick time. I've been shown the place he was buried in, on the north side of the church. You know the way in that part of the world. Anyone that's been hanged or made away with themselves, they bury them that side. As I said, he was the last of his line. And it was always rumoured that some friend of his must have planned to get hold of Francis's boy and put an end to his line, too. I should say now that it looks more as if old Gordy had managed the job himself. I've only to add that the picture is now in the Ashleyan Museum, and that though carefully watched, it's never been known to change again. to tell you of a curious series of events which happened in Castringham Hall in Suffolk. In the year 1690, the district in which the hall was situated was a scene of a number of witch trials. One of the victims was a Castringham woman. Mrs. Mothersole was her name, and what seems to have been fatal to her was the evidence of the then proprietor of Castringham Hall, Sir Matthew Fell. He deposed to having watched her on three different occasions from his window at the full of the moon gathering sprigs from the great old ash tree which grew within half a dozen yards of the house and whose branches all but touched the upper windows. On each occasion, Sir Matthew had done his best to capture the woman. 
but she had always taken alarm at some accidental noise he'd made, and all he could see when he got down to the garden was a hare running across the park in the direction of the village. Mainly on this evidence, though there was much more of a less striking and unusual kind from other parishioners, Mrs. Mothersole was found guilty and condemned to die. She was hanged a week after the trial with five or six more unhappy creatures at Bury St. Edmunds. The other victims were apathetic or broken down with misery. But Mrs. Mothersole was, as in life, so in death, of a very different temper. As a reporter of the time puts it, she looked upon those that laid hands upon her with so venomous an aspect that the mere thought of it preyed inwardly upon their minds for six months after. However, all that she is reported to have said were the seemingly meaningless words, there will be guests at the hall, which she repeated more than once in an undertone. A few months after the execution, when the moon of May was at the full, Sir Matthew and the vicar, Mr. Crome, were taking an evening stroll in sight of the ash tree, which I described as growing near the windows of the building, when Sir Matthew stopped and said, what is it that runs up and down the stem of the ash? It is never a squirrel. They will all be in their nests by now. The vicar looked and saw the moving creature, and he could have sworn, he said, that squirrel or not, it had more than four legs. Still, not much was to be made of the momentary vision, and the two men parted. Next day, Sir Matthew Fell was not downstairs at six in the morning, as was his custom, nor at seven, nor at eight. Hereupon the servants went and knocked at his chamber door. In the absence of a reply from within, the door was opened at last from the outside and they found their master dead. His corpse swollen and black. The parson was fetched and among papers he left are some notes, which I quote for the sake of the light they throw upon the course of events and also upon the common belief of the time. There was not any the least trace of an entrance having been forced to the chamber but the casement stood open, as my poor friend would always have it in this season. The body was very much disordered as it lay in the bed, being twisted after so extreme a sort as gave too probable conjecture that my worthy friend and patron had expired in great pain and agony. There was on the table by the bedside a Bible, in which my friend used nightly and upon his first rising to read a set portion. And I, taking it up, it came into my thoughts to make trial of that old and superstitious practice of drawing the sortes. I made then three trials, opening the book and placing my finger upon certain words, which gave in the first these words from Luke 13.7, cut it down. In the second, Isaiah 13.20, heat shall never be inhabited. And upon the third experiment, Job 39.30, her young ones also suck up blood. This is all that need be quoted from Mr. Crome's papers. Sir Matthew Fell was duly coffined and laid into the earth, and his son, Sir Matthew II, succeeded to the title and estates. It is to be mentioned, though the fact is not surprising, that the new baronet did not occupy the room in which his father had died, nor, indeed, was it slept in by anyone during the whole of his occupation. The second Sir Matthew died in 1735 and was duly succeeded by his son, Sir Richard. It was in his time that the great family pew was built out to the north side of the parish church. So large were the squire's ideas that several of the graves on that unhallowed side of the building had to be disturbed to satisfy his requirements. Among them was that of Mrs. Mothersole. Now, a certain amount of interest was excited in the village when it was known that the famous witch was to be exhumed, and the feeling of surprise and, indeed, disquiet was very strong when it was found that, though her coffin was fairly sound and unbroken, there was no trace whatever inside it of body, bones, or dust. The incident revived for a time. All the stories of witch trials and Sir Richard's orders that the coffin should be burnt were thought by a good many to be rather foolhardy, though they were duly carried out. One morning, it was in 1754, Sir Richard woke after a night of discomfort. His chimney had smoked persistently, and something had so rattled about the window that no man could get a moment's peace. Further, there was a prospect of several guests arriving in the course of the day. He must move to a room with a western lookout so that the sun could not wake him so early, and it must be out of the way of the business of the house. 
The housekeeper was at the end of her resources. Well, Sir Richard, she said, you know that there is but one room like that in the house, and that is Sir Matthew's, the West Chamber. No one has slept there these 40 years. Well, put me in there, for there I'll lie tonight, said her master. Any further discussions on the subject were cut short by the arrival of a visitor, William Crome, grandson of the late vicar. I must ask your indulgence for this intrusion, he said, but I am riding to Bury St. Edmunds with what haste I can make, and I have called in on my way to leave with you some papers of my late grandfather's, which we recently came upon. It is thought you may find some matters of family interest in them. They went to the study. The packet which young Mr. Crome had brought contained, among other things, the notes which the old vicar had made upon the occasion of Sir Matthew Fell's death. And for the first time, Sir Richard was confronted with the enigmatical sortes biblicae which you heard. They amused him a great deal. Well, he said, my grandfather's Bible gave one prudent piece of advice, cut it down. If that stands for the ash tree, he may rest assured I shall not neglect it. Such a nest of catars and agues was never seen. He took from the bookcase a Bible, which, sure enough, bore on the flyleaf the inscription to Matthew Fell, from his loving godmother, Anne Aldous, 2nd September, 1659. It would be no bad plan to test the old prophet again, Mr. Crow. I will wager we get a couple of names in the Chronicles. What have we here? Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. Well, well, your grandfather would have made a fine omen of that, eh? No more prophets for me. In the afternoon came the house guests. The Bishop of Kilmore, Lady Mary Harvey, Sir William Kenfield, etc. Dinner at five, wine, card, supper, and dispersal to bed. Next morning, Sir Richard was disinclined to take his gun with the rest. He walked instead along the terrace with the Bishop of Kilmore. This prelate, unlike a good many of the Irish bishops of his day, had visited his see, and indeed resided there for some considerable time. You could never get one of my Irish flock to occupy that room, Sir Richard, he said, pointing to the window of the West Room. They will always have it that it brings the worst of luck to sleep near an ash tree. And you have a fine growth of ash not two yards from your chamber window. Perhaps it has given you a touch of its quality already, for you do not seem, if I may say it, so much the fresher for your night's rest as your friends would like to see you. It can hardly be wholesome to have the air you breathe strained, as it were, through all the leafage. Your lordship is right there, I think, but I had not my window open last night. It was rather the scratching and rustling that went on, no doubt from the twigs sweeping the glass that kept me open-eyed. Still, the tree is to come down tomorrow, so I shall not hear much more from it. The day passed quietly, and night came, and the party dispersed to their rooms and wished Sir Richard a better night. And now we are in his bedroom with the light out and the squire in bed. The night outside is still warm, so the window stands open. There is very little light about the bedstead, but there is strange movement there. And now you would guess, so deceptive is the half-darkness, that he had several heads, round and brownish, which moved back and forward even as low as his chest. It is a horrible illusion. Is it nothing more? There, something drops off the bed with a soft plump like a kitten and is out of the window in a flash. And after that, there is quiet again. Thou shalt seek me in the morning, and I shall not be. As with Sir Matthew, so with Sir Richard, dead and black in his bed. A pale and silent party of guests and servants gathered under the window when the news was known. Italian poisoners, popish emissaries, infected air, all these and more guesses were hazarded. And the Bishop of Kilmore looked at the tree, where a white tomcat was crouching in the fork of the lower boughs, looking down into the hollow which years had gnawed in the trunk. It was watching something inside the tree with great interest. Suddenly it got up and craned over the hole. 
Then a bit of the edge on which it stood gave way and it went slithering in. Everyone looked up at the noise of the fall. It is known to most of us that a cat can cry, but few of us have heard, I hope, such a yell as came out of the trunk of the great ash. Two or three screams there were, and then a slight and muffled noise of some commotion or struggling. There is something more than we know of in that tree, said Sir William Kenfield to the bishop. My life upon it, but the secret of these terrible deaths is there. I am for an instant search. And this was agreed upon. A ladder was brought and one of the gardeners went up. But looking down into the hollow, he could detect nothing save a few dim indications of something moving. A lantern was lit and the gardener let it down by rope. They saw the yellow light upon his face as he bent over and saw his face struck with an incredulous terror and loathing before he cried out in a dreadful voice and fell back from the ladder in a dead faint. The lantern fell inside the tree and must have set fire to the dry leaves that lay there, for in a few minutes a dense smoke began to come up and then flames, and to be short, the tree was in a blaze. The bystanders made a ring at some yard's distance, and Sir William and the bishop sent men to get what weapons and tools they could, for clearly, whatever might be using the tree as its lair would be forced out by the fire. So it was. First, at the fork, they saw a round body covered with fire, the size of a man's head, leap into the air and fall on the grass, where after a moment it lay still. The bishop went as near as he dared to it and saw what? But the remains of an enormous spider, venous and seared. And as the fire burned lower down, more terrible bodies like this began to break out from the trunk, and it was seen that these were covered with grayish hair. All that day, the ash burned and until it fell to pieces, the men stood about it and from time to time killed the brutes as they darted out. At last, there was a long interval when none appeared and they cautiously closed in and examined the roots of the tree. They found, says the Bishop of Kilmore, below it, a rounded hollow place in the earth wherein were two or three bodies of these creatures that had plainly been smothered by the smoke. And what is to me more curious, at the side of this den against the wall was crouching the anatomy or skeleton of a human being, with the skin dried upon the bones, having some remains of black hair, which was pronounced by those that examined it to be undoubtedly the body of a woman. And clearly dead for a period of 50 years. There were, in an early year of this century, two members of the troop of scouts attached to a famous school, named respectively Arthur Wilcox and Stanley Judkins. They were the same age, boarded in the same house, were in the same division, and naturally were members of the same patrol. They were so much alike in appearance as to cause anxiety and trouble, and even irritation to the masters who came in contact with them. But oh, how different were they in their inward man or boy. As a scout, Arthur Wilcox secured every badge and distinction for which he competed. The cookery badge, the map-making badge, the life-saving badge, the badge for picking up bits of newspaper, the badge for not slamming the door when leaving pupil room, and many others. You cannot be surprised to hear that Mr. Hope Jones added a special verse to each of his songs in commendation of Arthur Wilcox. 
or that the lower master burst into tears when handing him the Good Conduct Medal in its handsome claret-colored case, the medal which had been unanimously voted to him by the whole of the third form. You cannot again wonder that in after years, Arthur Wilcox was the first boy to become captain of both the school and of the opulence, or that the strain of carrying out the duties of both positions, coupled with the ordinary work of the school, was so severe that a complete rest for six months, followed by a voyage round the world, was pronounced an absolute necessity by the family doctor. It would be a pleasant task to trace the steps by which he attained the giddy eminence he now occupies. But for the moment, enough of Arthur Wilcox. Time presses and we must turn to a very different matter, the career of Stanley Judkins. As a scout, Stanley Judkins secured no badge save those which he was able to abstract from members of other patrols. In the cookery competition, he was detected trying to introduce squibs into the Dutch oven of the next door competitors. For the tidiness badge, he was disqualified because in the midsummer school time, which chanced to be hot, he could not be dissuaded from sitting with his fingers in the ink, as he said, for coolness sake. For one piece of paper which he picked up, he must have dropped at least six banana skins or orange peels. Aged women, seeing him approaching, would beg him with tears in their eyes not to carry their pails of water across the road. They knew too well what the result would be. In short, Stanley Judkins was no credit to the scouts. And there was talk on more than one occasion of informing him that his services were no longer required. In the end, however, milder counsels prevailed and it was decided to give him another chance. So it is that we find him camping with the troop at the beginning of the midsummer holidays. It was a lovely morning. Stanley and one or two of his friends, for he still had friends, lay basking on the top of a grassy down, staring at a clump of trees in the middle distance. I wonder what that place is called, said Stanley. Anybody got a map? Here's one, said Wilfred Pipsqueak, ever resourceful. And there's the place marked on it. But it's inside the Red Ring. We're not allowed there. You can ask this old chap what it's called if you're so keen to find out, said Algernon de Montmorency. This old chap was an old shepherd who had come up and was standing behind him. Good morning, young gents, he said. You got a fine day for your doings, ain't you? Yes, thank you, said Algernon with native politeness. Can you tell us what that clump over there is called? And what's that thing inside it? Of course I can tell you, said the shepherd. That's wailing well, that is. But you ain't got no call to worry about that. There ain't a man or a sheep in these parts uses wailing well, nor haven't done all the years I've lived here. Well, there'll be a record broken today, then, said Stanley Judkins, because I shall go and get some water out of it for tea. Sakes alive, young gentleman, said the shepherd in a startled voice. Don't you get to talking that way. Why ain't your master give you notice not to go by there? Yes, they have said Wilfred Pipsqueak. Shut up, you ass, said Stanley Judkins. What's the matter with it? Isn't the water good? I don't know as there's anything much wrong with the water, said the shepherd. All I know is my old dog wouldn't go through that field, let alone me or anyone else that's got a morsel of brains in their heads. But I see there's tracks in it, said Wilfred. Someone must go through it sometimes. Tracks, said the shepherd. I believe you. Four tracks. Three women and a man. Who are they? asked Algernon. Why do they go there? There's some perhaps could tell you who they was, said the shepherd. But it was afore my time they come by their end. And why they go there still is more than the children of men can tell. Except I've heard they was all bad uns when they was alive. Why, you don't mean they're deaders, cried Stanley. What rot! There must be a lot of fools to believe that. Who's ever seen them, I'd like to know? I've seen them, young gentlemen, said the shepherd. About four o'clock of the day it was, much such a day as this. I see them, each one of them, come peering out the bushes and stand up and work their way slow by them tracks towards the trees in the middle where the well is. And what were they like? Do tell us, said Algernon and Wilfred eagerly. Rags and bones, young gentlemen. All four of them fluttering rags and whitey bones. It seemed to me as if I could hear them clacking as they got along. Very slow they went and looking from side to side. 
boys pondered for some moments on what they'd heard, after which Wilfred said, And why is it called Wailing Well? If you was round here at dusk of a winter's evening, you wouldn't want to ask why, was all the shepherd said. Early in the afternoon of next day, the following dialogue was heard. Wilcox, is all your tent there? No, sir, Judkins isn't. That boy is the most infernal nuisance ever invented. Where do you suppose he is? Sir, I shouldn't wonder if he'd gone to the Wailing Well. Do you mean inside the Red Ring? Good heavens, what makes you think he's gone there? Why, he was terribly keen to know about it yesterday, and we were talking to a shepherd man, and he told us a lot about it and advised us not to go there. But Judkins didn't believe him and said he meant to go. Young ass, said Mr. Hope Jones. Did he take anything with him? Yes, I think he took some rope and a can. We did tell him he'd be a fool to go, little brute. What the deuce does he mean by pinching stores like that? Well, come along, you three, we must go after him. Why can't people keep the simplest orders? It was a wonderful day of shimmering heat. The sea looked like a floor of metal. There was no breath of wind. They were all exhausted when they got to the top and flung themselves down on the hot grass. Below them, the well inside the clump of bent and gnarled scotch firs was plainly visible. And so were the four tracks winding about among the thorns and rough growth. Nothing to be seen of them yet, said Mr. Hope Jones. But we must keep a sharp lookout. I thought I saw the bushes stir down there. Yes, said Wilcox, so did I. Look, no, that can't be him. It's somebody, though, putting their head up, isn't it? I thought it was, but I'm not sure. Silence for a moment. Then, that's him, sure enough, said Wilcox, getting over the hedge on the far side, don't you see? With a shiny thing, that's the can you said he had. Yes, it's him, and he's making straight for the tree, said Wilfred. At this moment, Algernon, who had been staring with all his might, broke into a scream. What's on that track? On all fours, oh, it's the woman. Oh, don't let me look at her, don't let it happen. And he rolled over, clutching at the grass and trying to bury his head in it. Stop that, said Mr. Hope Jones loudly, but it was no use. Look here, he said. I must go down there. You stop here, Wilfred, and look after that boy. Wilcox, you run as hard as you can to the camp and get some help. They ran off, both of them. Wilfred was left alone with Algernon and did his best to calm him, but indeed he was not much happier himself. From time to time, he glanced down the hill and into the field. He saw Mr. Hope Jones drawing nearer at a swift pace, and then, to his great surprise, he saw him stop, look up and round about him and turn quickly off at an angle. What could be the reason? He looked at the field, and there he saw a terrible figure, something in ragged black with whitish patches breaking out of it. The head perched on a long, thin neck, half hidden by a shapeless sort of blackened sunbonnet. The creature was waving thin arms in the direction of the rescuer who was approaching, as if to ward him off. And between the two figures, the air seemed to shake and shimmer as he had never seen it. He looked away hastily to see Stanley Judkins making his way pretty quickly towards the clump and in proper scout fashion, picking his steps with care to avoid treading on snapping sticks or being caught by arms of brambles. Evidently, though he saw nothing, he suspected some sort of ambush and was trying to go noiselessly. Wilfred saw all that, and he saw more too. With a sudden and dreadful sinking of the heart, he caught sight of someone among the trees waiting, and again of someone, another, of the hideous black figures working slowly along the track from another part of the field, looking from side to side as the shepherd had described it. Worst of all, he saw a fourth, unmistakably a man this time, rising out of the bushes a few yards behind the wretched Stanley and painfully, as it seemed, crawling into the track. On all sides, the miserable victim was cut off. Wilfred was at his wit's end. He rushed at Algernon and shook him. Get up, he said. Yell, yell as loud as you can. Oh, if we'd only got a whistle. Algernon pulled himself together. There's one, he said. Will Cox is. He must have dropped it. So one whistled, the other screamed. In the still air, the sound carried. Stanley heard. He stopped. He turned round. And then, indeed, a cry was heard more piercing and dreadful than any that the boys on the hill could raise. It was too late. The crouched figure behind Stanley sprang at him 
and caught him about the waist. Stanley struck with his can, the only weapon he had. The rim of a broken black hat fell off the creature's head and showed a white skull with stains that might be wisps of hair. By this time, one of the women had reached the pair and was pulling at the rope that was coiled about Stanley's neck. Between them, they overpowered him in a moment. The awful screaming ceased and then the three passed within the circle of the clump of furs. It for a moment. It seemed as if rescue might come. Mr. Hope Jones had scrambled over the hedge and was plunging through the bushes. At the same time, the boys glanced behind them and saw a troop of figures coming over the top of the next down. The rescuers from the camp had arrived. A few hasty words and all were dashing down the hill. They had just entered the field when they met Mr. Hope Jones. Over his shoulder hung the corpse of Stanley Judkins. He'd cut it from the branch to which he found it hanging, waving to and fro. There was not a drop of blood in the body. On the following day, Mr. Hope Jones sallied forth with an axe and with the expressed intention of cutting down every tree in the clump and of burning every bush in the field. He returned with a nasty cut in his leg and a broken axe helve. Not a spark of fire could he light, and on no single tree could he make the least impression. I have heard that the present population of the Wailing Well field consists of three women, a man, and a boy. Such is the story of the career of Stanley Judkins and of a portion of the career of Arthur Wilcox. It has, I believe, never been told before. If it has a moral, that moral is, I trust, obvious. If it has none, I do not well know how to help it. As soon as full term at the university was over, Professor Parkins travelled down to Burnstow on the east coast. The village boasted a fine golf course, and Parkins planned to spend a week or so there improving his game. He was soon installed in a large twin-bedded room at the Globe Inn, looking over the seashore. The rest of the population of the inn was, naturally, a golfing one. But the most conspicuous figure was an ancien militaire, secretary of a London club a man with a bristling moustache and incarnadined features who was possessed of a voice of incredible strength and of views of a pronouncedly Protestant type. These were apt to find utterance after his attendance upon the ministrations of the vicar, an estimable man with inclinations towards a picturesque ritual. It was this Colonel Wilson in whose company Parkin spent the greater part of the following day improving his game. And whether the process of improvement were to blame or not, by the end of the afternoon, the Colonel's demeanour had assumed a colouring so lurid that even Parkins jibbed at the thought of walking home with him from the links. He decided instead to go back to the inn by way of the beach, and while there was still enough light, to try and discover the site of an ancient Templar's preceptory, which he knew to be in the area. He soon found what he was looking for. A patch of somewhat broken ground covered with small depressions and mounds. At one end, there was an oblong eminence which could possibly have been the base of a platform or altar. It might, thought Parkins, be as well to probe the soil here for evidences of masonry. And he took out his knife and began scraping away the earth. Now followed another little discovery. A portion of soil fell inward as he scraped and disclosed a small cavity. As he withdrew the knife, he heard a metallic clink. When he introduced his hand, it met with a cylindrical object lying on the floor of the hole. Naturally enough, he picked it up. And when he brought it out into the light, he could see that it was of man's making, a metal tube about four inches long, and evidently of some considerable age. 
By the time Parkins had made sure there was nothing else in the cavity, it was too late and too dark for him to think of undertaking any further search. The wind was bitter from the north, and he quickly rattled and clashed across the shingle towards the sand. One last look behind showed him a prospect of company on his walk in the shape of a rather indistinct personage who seemed to be making great efforts to catch up with him, but made little, if any, progress. Parkins decided that he almost certainly did not know this person and that it would be absurd to wait until he came up. Besides, there was less than a quarter of an hour until dinner. And perhaps that is why Parkins felt obliged to run most of the way back to the inn without once looking behind him. When he met the Colonel at dinner, peace, or as much of it as that gentleman could manage, reigned once more on the military bosom. Nor was she put to flight in the hours of bridge that followed, for Parkins was a more than respectable player. He felt that he had spent his evening in a, quite a satisfactory way, and it was nearly midnight when he retired to his room and saw on the chest of drawers his little discovery of that afternoon. With some curiosity, he turned it over by the light of a candle. It was of bronze, he now saw, and was shaped very much like a modern dog whistle. Examining it more closely, he could see that there were marks on it and not merely marks, but letters. Quis est iste qui venit. I am a little rusty in my Latin, thought Parkins, but it ought to mean, who is this who is coming? Well, the best way to find out is evidently to blow the whistle for him. He blew, tentatively, and stopped, suddenly, startled and yet pleased at the note he had elicited. It had a quality of infinite distance in it. And soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles around. It was a sound, too, that seemed to have the power of forming pictures in the brain. He saw quite clearly for a moment a vision of a wide, dark expanse at night with a fresh wind blowing and in the midst a lonely figure. How employed, he could not tell. Perhaps he would have seen more. But at that moment, there was a tremendous gust of wind. The window burst open and both candles in the room were instantly extinguished. The force of the gale was enough to tear the room to pieces. Parkins, struggling with the casement, felt almost as if he were pushing back a sturdy burglar, so strong was the pressure. Then all at once it slackened, and the window banged to and latched itself. But quickly as it had risen, the wind did not fall at once. On it went, through the night, moaning and rushing past the house, at times rising to a cry so desolate that it might have made fanciful people feel quite uncomfortable. Even the unimaginative, thought Parkins, as he lay in his bed, might be happier without it. Whether it was the wind or the excitement of golf or the researches in the preceptory that kept him awake, he was not sure. He found a little vicarious comfort in the idea that someone else was in the same boat, for he could hear one of his neighbours tossing and rustling in bed too. Finally, with many misgivings as to incipient failure of eyesight, overworked brain, excessive smoking and so on, Parkins resigned himself to light a candle and read. The scraping of the match on the box and the glare of light must have startled some creatures of the night, rats or whatnot which he heard scurry across the floor from the side of his bed with much rustling. The match went out before he could see anything, but the second one burned better, and the candle was duly lit. Parkins pored over a book until sleep of a wholesome kind came upon him, and for about the first time in his orderly and prudent life, he forgot to blow out the candle so that when he woke in the morning, there was still a flicker in the socket and a sad mess of guttered grease on the top of the little table. After breakfast, he was in his room, putting the finishing touches to his golfing costume, when one of the maids came in. Would you like any uh, extra blankets on your bed, sir? She asked. Ah, thank you, said Parkins. Yes, I think I should like one. It seems likely to turn colder. Which bed should I put it on, sir? Why, the one I slept in last night, exclaimed Parkins. I beg pardon, sir, but you seem to have tried both of them. At least ways we had to make them both up this morning. Really? How very absurd said Parkins. Well, I may have disordered it more than I thought when I unpacked my things. I'm very sorry to have given you the extra trouble, I'm sure. Then he set forth with a stern determination to improve his game. 
I'm glad to be able to report that he succeeded so far in his enterprise that the Colonel, whom Fortune had again allotted to him for a partner, became quite chatty as the morning advanced. Extraordinary win we had last night, he boomed. In my old home, we should have said that someone had been whistling for it. Should you indeed, said Parkins. Well, I would certainly not hold with such a superstitious belief myself. Though, as it happens, I was whistling last night, and the wind seemed to come absolutely in answer to my call. The colonel, upon hearing Parkins' account of the discovery of the whistle at the site of the Templar's preceptory, opined that he should be careful about using a thing that had belonged to a set of papists. After all, you never knew what they might have been up to. From this topic, he diverged to the enormities of the vicar, who, in the colonel's view, was at the least a concealed papist, if not a Jesuit. And Parkins, who could not very readily follow the colonel in this region, did not disagree with him. In fact, they got on so well together in the morning that there was no talk on either side of their separating after lunch. The subject of the whistle, however, was not raised again until after dinner, when Parkins produced it from his room for the colonel to see. The old warrior turned it over gingerly in the light of a candle. What do you mean to do with it? he asked. Well, when I get it back to Cambridge, I shall submit it to some of the archaeologists there, and if they consider it worth having, I may present it to one of the museums. Hmm, said the colonel. Well, it may be right. All I know is that if it were mine, I should chuck it straight into the sea. Still, I expect with you it's a case of live and learn. I hope so, I'm sure, and I wish you a good night. Parkins must have slept for an hour or more when a sudden sound shook him up in a most unwelcome manner. For some minutes he lay there. And he turned over sharply and listened breathlessly with his eyes wide open. There had been a movement, he was sure, in the empty bed on the opposite side of the room. Now it began again, a rustling and shaking, surely more than any rat could cause. I can figure to myself something of the professor's bewilderment and horror, for I have in a dream 30 years back seen the same thing happen. But it will be hard, perhaps, to imagine how dreadful it was to him to see a figure suddenly sit up in what he had known was an empty bed. He was out of his own bed in one bound and made a dash towards the window where lay his only weapon, a walking stick. This was the worst thing he could have done because the personage in the empty bed with a sudden smooth motion moved across the room and took up a position with outspread arms in front of the door. Parkins watched it for some moments in a horrid perplexity. Somehow the idea of getting past it and escaping through the door was intolerable to him. And as for its touching him, he would sooner dash himself through the window than have that happen. It stood for a moment in a band of dark shadow. Then it began to move in a stooping posture. And all at once the spectator realized with some horror and some relief that it must be blind for it seemed to feel about it with its muffled arms in a groping and random fashion. Turning half away from him, it became suddenly conscious of the bed he'd just left, darted towards it and bent over and felt in the pillows in a way which made Parkins shudder as he had never in his life thought it possible. In a very few moments, it seemed to know that the bed was empty and then moving forwards into the area of light and facing the window, it showed for the first time what manner of thing it was. Parkins, who very much dislikes being questioned about it, did once describe something of it in my hearing, and I gathered that what he chiefly remembers about it is a horrible, an intensely horrible face of crumpled linen. But he was not at leisure to watch it for long. With formidable quickness, it moved into the middle of the room. And as it groped and waved, one corner of its drapery swept across Parkin's face. Though he knew how perilous the sound was, he could not keep back a cry of disgust, and this gave the searcher an instant clue. It leapt towards him, and the next moment he was halfway through the window, backwards, uttering cry upon cry at the utmost pitch of his voice. And the linen face was thrust close into his own. At this almost the last possible second, deliverance came. The colonel burst the door open and was just in time to see the dreadful group at the window. When he reached the figures, only one was left. 
pockets, sank forward into the room in a faint. And before him on the floor lay a tumbled heap of bedclothes. Colonel Wilson asked no questions, but busied himself in keeping everyone else out of the room and in getting Parkins back to his bed. And himself, wrapped in a rug, occupied the other bed for the rest of the night. Early on the next day, he left the hotel door carrying a small object between his fingers and thumb, which he cast as far into the sea as a very brawny arm could send it. The whole thing, he said, served to confirm his opinion of the Church of Rome. There is really little more to tell. But as you may imagine, the professor's nerves have suffered. He cannot even now see a surplus hanging on a door quite unmoved. And the spectacle of a scarecrow in a field late on a winter afternoon has cost him more than one sleepless night. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther were at breakfast in the parlour of Westfield Hall in the county of Essex. They were arranging plans for the day. George, said Mrs. Anstruther, I think you had better go to Malden and see if you can get any of those knitted things I was speaking about which would do for my stall at the bazaar. Oh, well, if you wish it, Mary, of course I can do that. But I had half arranged to play a round with Geoffrey Williamson this morning. Uh, what shall you do yourself? Why? When the work of the house is arranged for, I must see about laying out my new rose garden. By the way, before you start out for Malden, I wish you would just take Collins to look at the place I fixed upon. You know it, of course. Oh, yes. Oh, where we were saying there must have been a summer house once. The place with the old seats and the posts. Uh, but do you think there's enough sun there? My dear George, do allow me some common sense. There will be plenty of sun when we've got rid of some of the box bushes. All I want Collins to do is clear away the old posts and seats and things before I come out in an hour's time. And I hope you will manage to get off fairly soon. Within a few minutes, Mr. Anstruther had discovered Collins in the greenhouse, and they were on their way to the site of the projected rose garden. I am inclined to believe that Mrs. Anstruther, though in the habit of describing herself as a great gardener, had not been well advised in her selection of a spot for the purpose. It was a small, dark clearing, bounded on one side by a path, and on the other by thick box bushes, laurels, and other evergreens. The ground was almost bare of grass and dark of aspect. Remains of rustic seats and an old corrugated oak post somewhere near the middle of the clearing had given rise to Mr. Anstruther's conjecture that a summer house had once stood there. Clearly, Collins had not been put in possession of his mistress's intentions with regard to this plot of ground. And when he learnt them from Mr. Anstruther, he displayed no enthusiasm. Of course, I could clear them seats away soon enough, he said. But that's firm in the ground, that post is. That's been there a number of years, Mr. Anstruther. I doubt I shan't get that up, not quite so soon as what I can do with them seats. But your mistress specially wishes it to be got out of the way in an hour's time, said Mr. Anstruther. Colin smiled and shook his head slowly. You'll excuse me, sir, but you feel of it for yourself. No, sir, no one can't do what's impossible to him, can they, sir? I could get that post up by after tea time, sir, but that'll want a lot of digging. What you require, sir, you see, sir, if you'll excuse me naming of it, you want the soil loosening round this post here, and me and the boy, we shall take a little time doing of that. Very well, sighed Mr. Anstruther. I'll tell your mistress that you can see your way to clearing the seats at once and the post this afternoon. Good morning. Collins was left rubbing his chin. 
Mrs. Anstruther received the report with some discontent, but did not insist upon any changes of plan. By four o'clock that afternoon, she had just settled down to her sketch of the church as seen from the shrubbery, when a maid came hurrying down the path to say that Miss Wilkins had called. Miss Wilkins was one of the few remaining members of the family from whom the Anstruthers had bought the Westfield estate some years back. She'd been staying in the neighborhood and this proved to be a farewell visit. The two ladies strolled through the grounds of the hall and eventually reached the site of the planned rose garden. The details of the project were laid before Miss Wilkins at some length, but her thoughts were evidently elsewhere. Yes, delightful, she said at last, rather absently. Uh, but do you know, Mrs. Anstruther, I'm afraid I was thinking of old times and how neither my brother Frank nor I would ever care to be alone in this place when we were children. But one very hot autumn day, I was looking for Frank to fetch him to tea and going down this path, I suddenly saw him asleep on the bench in the old summer house with such a dreadful look on his face that I really thought he must be ill or even dead. I rushed at him and shook him and told him to wake up and wake up he did with a scream. I assure you, the poor boy seemed almost beside himself with fright. It came out at last that he'd had a very odd, disjointed dream. First he made out that he was standing in a large room with a number of people in it, and someone was opposite to him who was very powerful, and questions were asked which he felt to be very important. All the voices sounded to him very distant, but he remembered bits of things that were said. Where were you on the 19th of October? Is this your handwriting? And so on. I can see now, of course, that he was dreaming of some trial. But it was odd that a boy of eight could have such a vivid idea of what went on in a court. He said that all the time he felt the most intense anxiety and oppression and hopelessness. Then, after that, there came another sort of picture. He was being taken through a street. It was very cold. And then he was led up some creaking wooden steps and stood on a sort of platform. But the only thing he could actually see was a fire burning somewhere near him. Someone who had been holding his hand left hold of it and went towards his fire. And if I had not wakened him up, he didn't know what would have become of him. A curious dream for a child to have, wasn't it? Well, so much for that. It must have been later in the year that I was sitting in the arbor just about sunset reading a book. All at once, I became conscious that someone was whispering to me. The only words I could distinguish were something like, pull, pull, I'll push. You, Paul. I started up in something of a fright. The voice sounded so hoarse and angry, and yet as if it came from a long, long way off, just as it had done in Frank's dream. But it was strongest when I put my ear to an old post, which was part of the end of the seat. In fact, it was just like that post you have there. My father got to know that both of us had had a fright in the arbor, and he went down there himself one evening after dinner, and the arbor was pulled down at very short notice. I recollect hearing my father talking about it to an old man who used to do odd jobs in the place, and the old man saying, don't you fear for that, sir, he's sound enough in there so long as no one lets him out. But when I asked who it was, I could get no satisfactory answer. I've often asked the older people in the village whether they knew of anything strange, but either they knew nothing or they wouldn't tell me. The conversation moved on. And Miss Wilkins took her leave shortly afterwards. The seats and the posts were cleared away and uprooted, respectively, by that evening. During dinner time, Mrs. Collins sent up and asked for a little brandy because her husband had taken a nasty chill and she was afraid he would not be able to do much next day. Mrs. Anstruther's reflections the next morning were not wholly placid. She was sure some roughs had got into the plantation during the night. And another thing, George. The moment Collins is about again, you must tell him to do something about the owls. I never heard anything like them, and I'm positive one came and perched somewhere just outside our window. Didn't you hear it? No, of course you were sound asleep as usual. Still, I must say, George, you don't look as if your night had done you much good. My dear, I feel as if another of the same would turn me silly. You have no idea of the dreams I had. First, I was in an old-fashioned sort of panelled room. I remembered there was a fireplace with a lot of burnt papers in it, and I was in a great state of anxiety about something. Next, I heard several people coming upstairs and a noise like spurs on a boarded floor, and then the door opened and whatever it was I was expecting happened. Then I was in a large room, panelled, I think, like the other, 
and I was evidently being tried for my life, I've no doubt, from the state I was in. I had no one speaking for me, and somewhere there was a fearful fellow on the bench, I should have said, only that he seemed to be pitching into me most unfairly and twisting everything I said and asking most abominable questions about dates when I was at particular places and letters I was supposed to have written and why I had destroyed some papers. And I recollect his laughing at answers I made in a way that quite daunted me. I am quite certain that there was such a man once, and a most horrible villain he must have been. After that, I was taken outside. Was it a dark, cold day, and a fire burning somewhere near you? Why, George, yes it was. And someone was holding on to my arm, and I remember seeing a ladder and hearing the sound of a lot of people. I've no doubt it was an execution for high treason, but Mary, I know what you are going to ask. I suppose this is an instance of a kind of thought reading. Miss Wilkins called yesterday and told me of a kind of dream her brother had as a child when they lived here, and something did no doubt make me think of that when I was awake last night listening to those owls and those men talking and laughing in the shrubbery, and so, I suppose, from my brain it must have got into yours while you were asleep. Curious, no doubt. And I'm sorry it gave you such a bad night. After lunch, Mrs. Anstruther settled herself comfortably upon her sketching chair on the path leading through the shrubbery to the side gate of the churchyard. She worked hard, and the drawing was becoming a really pleasant thing to look upon by the time that the wooded hills to the west had shut out the sun. She rose and turned towards the house, pausing for a time to take delight in the limpid green western sky. As she stood there, Something rustled in the box bush on her left, and she turned and started at seeing what at first she took to be a 5th of November mask peeping out among the branches. She looked a little closer. It was not a mask. It was a face, large, smooth, and pink. She remembers the minute drops of perspiration which were starting from its forehead. She remembers how the jaws were clean-shaven and the eyes shut. She remembers also, and with an accuracy which makes the thought intolerable to her, how the mouth opened and a single tooth appeared below the upper lip. As she looked, the face receded into the darkness of the bush. The shelter of the house was gained and the door shut before she collapsed. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther, had been for a week or more recruiting at Brighton before they received a circular from the Essex Archaeological Society and a query as to whether they possessed certain historical portraits which it was desired to include in the forthcoming work on Essex portraits to be published under the Society's auspices. This was an accompanying letter from the secretary which contained the following passage. We are especially anxious to know whether you possess the original of the engraving of which I enclose a photograph. It represents the Lord Chief Justice under Charles II, who, as you doubtless know, retired after his disgrace to Westfield and is supposed to have died there of remorse. It may interest you to hear that the parish was so much troubled after his death that the rector of Westfield summoned the parsons of all the neighboring parishes to come and lay him, which they did. A curious entry in the register at Prior's Ruthing notes that the stake is in the field adjoining to the churchyard of Westfield on the west side. Perhaps you can let us know if any tradition to this effect is current in your parish. The incidents which the enclosed photograph recalled were productive of a severe shock to Mrs. Anstruther. It was decided that she should spend the winter abroad. Mr. Anstruther, when he went down to Westfield to make the necessary arrangements, not unnaturally told his story to the rector, who showed little surprise. Yes, he said. It was bad at first, like owls, as you say, and men talking sometimes. One night it was in this garden, and at other times about several of the cottages. But lately there has been very little. I think it'll die out. There is nothing in our registers except the entry of the burial, and what I for a long time took to be the family motto. But last time I looked at it, I noticed that it was added quite late in the 17th century. Quieta non movere. Do not disturb the peace. 
or as we would say, let sleeping dogs lie. And I suppose, well, rather hard to say exactly what I do suppose.